Is it possible two artists in one household? It is, yes. Just a short account of our romance Valentine's Day, right? In love with art. When we met 20 years ago, it was Adam who introduced me to painting in outdoors. Thank you. What a wonderful new experience that turned out to be after painting indoors for years with watercolors. On some days, we had a picnic along with our painting gear, hop into Adam's convertible, roof down, playing some ABBA, and drive up island. It wasn't difficult to find a beautiful spot to paint near Genoa Bay. One year, we even painted on a bitterly cold day in the snow. That was quite the test of life in love with art. During the summer months, we'd go on road trips to the interior. Once we found a suitable location, we'd stop find a safe place to stand and paint for about an hour and a half. Our destination and home base was a motel in Newton. <laughs> <laughs> From there, we'd go on day trips to the surrounding areas and paint. Once, when we were returning from Newton, we reached the top of a hill and we saw this magnificent sea. The Fraser River, mountains that seem to go on endlessly. And a thunderous looking sky. It had to be painted. We set up our easels and began painting. We had forgotten that we were standing just a few feet away from the track route. We spent the next hour and a half painting to the sound of heavy trucks roaring by. Not exactly the safest place to paint, but all in the name of life in love with art. A highlight of our trip to the UK was the discovery of a wheat field full of red poppies with an ancient manor house in the background. An ideal place to paint. One year, we took a road trip to California. The highlight of that trip was painting the sand dunes in the desert of Death Valley, the hottest, driest, and lowest point in North America. For our next trip, we headed further south to Australia. One day, when Adam was painting on our balcony, a beautiful white cockatoo flew down, sat on the coffee table, and watched Adam painting for a while. He just sat there, eating some almonds that I had left on the table. As he flew off, he took flight, and I was crossing my fingers that he wouldn't practice his newfound painting lesson by splashing some additional paint to Adam's masterpiece. But luckily, he didn't. Painting in the Cook Islands was yet another magical experience. The white sand beaches, the crystal clear water, so smooth, and calm, the tall palm trees, the friendly islanders, paradise. An idyllic place for painting and enjoying life in love with art. Recently, Adam and I have been encouraging our grandchildren with their painting experiences. Watching children painting is when you see a fully engaged child. How they love to explore mixing colors, 
making bold strokes and contented with their results. I'd like to end with a quote by Picasso. All children are artists. The trouble is how to remain an artist once the child grows up. Here's to our future generation of artists and to life in love with art. Madam, thank you Karen for all your attentions this evening. On the wall over there, if you can see it, you can see what we do. Mine is the nearest one. Probably, by looking at them, you'll see that we don't argue much. <laughs> we certainly don't compete. We have David Ferguson and Miles Lowry, the wonderful, the amazing, and the talented, and creative, and dear hearts in our world as well. <laughs> I'm going to hold this because I learned years ago not to do this for a prolonged period of time. <laughs> um, my name is David Ferguson. Um, a lot of you might know me in Victoria as a dance artist, but I'm also a writer and a painter. I'm currently writing a play for the Belfry Theatre, and my paintings are in this room here. Um, Miles and Lowry and myself run Suddenly Dance Theatre Society, which is a nonprofit society in Victoria, and we've been running it for 26 years. I formed the company when I was 18 years old, so you can do the math. Um, so the point where we collaborate most is with theater and with dance and with uh, our film projects. And we're going to show you a short film later uh, in this talk. But we also are both painters, and we share a studio for creating paintings. And that's sort of the, what we're represented here, are mostly the, the painted works. And there's a kind of connection in our, in our worlds because we share some materials, but we work very differently. So it's a very intimate space in that we're working around each other, we're using the same materials. And we have the advantage, and I think it's the big thing about coupledom, is that you have choices to make, how much time to spend looking at each other's work, talking about each other, but we're always basically helping each other in one way or another get through whatever the process is. And whether it's physical, David helps me build a lot of my work, the castings that are involved in my sculptures are complicated, they take more than just me. And so David, of course, is a wonderful uh, helper in that sense, and he also brings his artistic eye to it. So I have to give him credit for that, because he will he'll work on a sculptural piece with me and have a big part in it. Um, Paintings, I think, are much more personal. It's sort of like novelists, where you have to just, it's you, and there's nobody else really, uh, you know, so it's not a collaborative process, but the sculptures are a little bit collaborative, and certainly the work we do uh, with film and in theater is very collaborative. Um, here, you say something. <laughs> Um, well, I was thinking about when we were asked to do this, how do artists survive together? And uh, one of them is that we have the benefit of instantly solving problems, um, like what's been said. Another is that we have different systems of working. Um, I get up at 4.30 in the morning every day, and then my high time to work is between 4.30 and maybe noon. So that's when I'm most chatty and most awake, and that's when I do my writing. Uh, and then I'll go to the dance studio from that point on. Whereas Miles will stay up till 3 or 4 in the morning, and we have a little narrow window of passing. Um, and in, in some ways that's really helped us also remain independent, because we do collaborate so much, um, and, and that time that we both have, um, we've defined and we know, we, we realize that that's an important part of, of how to create together, is knowing when to be give each other space. Um, because we're working in the same space, essentially. So we don't give each other that time. We're always together. And I don't know if any of you know 
what it's like to work and live with, the, like in a trailer or something. It's not quite a trailer, but you have to give each other space. And so we found ways to do that. And sometimes we don't choose to work on the same projects for just to have that time out. Um, and when David's writing, for instance, like he, he gets up in the morning, he's raring to go. I get up in the morning if it's not, you know, 10 o'clock, and I am, I'm no good. No one should talk to me. I need my coffee. We have very opposite ways of, of operating. And so we've learned to balance it out. And after 27 years, we have a pretty good system going. Um, We're going to show tonight uh, a film that we made for Bravo. It was a Bravo fact, so it was made through our dance company, Suddenly Dance Theatre. And over the course of uh, 26 years, one way that we've survived living on this island, uh, both as artists and as uh, members of the dance company, is to make works for film. So we've made several films for Bravo Television, or little short films for Bravo Fact, and this is one of our Bravo Fact films. It's called Guthrie Swims the Lake. Um, and just a little backstory about the film, uh, I'm in it. <laughs> Miles captured it and directed it, and so it was really a dogma-style film. It was the two of us in the middle of Ireland in a cold Irish lake um, making this piece over a couple of weeks. And we only had a small, narrow window to work each day between 6 and 8 in the morning when the sun was just right on the water. Um, and I play in the film Tyrone Guthrie, who was a famous Irish theatre director, and in Canada he formed the Stratford, film, uh, the Stratford Festival in Ontario, that's the, the Canadian connection. And he was a director of Shakespeare, so in the film you're about to see, it's, a, it's an homage to him, it's a portrait of, uh, of Tyrone Guthrie with uh, watery thoughts from Shakespeare. <laughs> So 
Um, a little bit about me, I've been, my background's graffiti, I've been in graffiti for over 30 years. I do fine art as well, like abstracts and dog portraits, and I play with watercolors and stuff. Uh, we lived in Surrey for the last uh, nine years or so, and then we moved here about four years ago. So it's been nice coming to a city where there's no gunshots. Either. No gunshots. <laughs> uh, we're not painting, listening to the sound of the police helicopter circling our building. So it's been a, a nice little break. Um, so as you can see, we're two big guys, and we have a apartment or a condo that's about 600 square feet. So it's kind of interesting to hear people say that their studio is about 800 square feet in their basement, which is awesome. Um, as you can see, we're, we work side by side in a small little area. We both have our own tables. We have a beautiful view. We're right down in Chinatown, and we're constantly inspired by the surroundings and the colors and, and the people and, and all that stuff. But we've, um, we've come to the, to the realization that we can't always be polite to each other all the time. Um, so we've actually got these little things that we do. Um, and this is the funny thing because our friends are here. We have quite a few friends. And, and, they, and they've never seen this stuff. So it's like, this is like the shadows. It's like, you know, all the, the stuff that we do when we're alone and no one else sees it. So it's kind of, it'll be interesting to see what people think. So we came up, we came up with these little dances because uh, we wanted a way so when we got irritated, we didn't end up turning an argument out of nothing where we start saying things we don't mean because we're frustrated. Uh, usually we're frustrated because one or both of us are hungry and we're just getting angry. And that's pretty much it. So then when we started, I forgot how it came out, but I think one of us, probably me, was mad one day and then Chris just started doing this dance, and I was like, what are you doing? And he's I like, keep sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So, they're not classically trained dancers. <laughs> 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 so, these will not look that good. Yeah, we'll do one. Okay, we'll do one. We'll do one. one for now, and we'll see if we'll, we'll read the room. <laughs> One of us realizes, okay, this can get a little bit too personal or too far for no reason. So then we have these rules. So if we call the names of these certain dances, it doesn't matter how much one of us is angry or not, we have to follow the rules. <laughs> so, like one of them is simple, it's called Bach. So we just go, and that means we have to give a quick kiss. So it doesn't matter if you feel like, I hate you, I'm so mad at you, and you just Bach. And it's like, ah! <laughs> But then you do, and it just clears, clears attention, and then it's like, look, we're not, we're not mad, you're not mad, it's just for frustration. So what are we going to do? Uh, let's do, are you ready for a mouth kiss? Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he's just on, so imagine we're in the middle of an argument. <laughs> and so you'll like, understand at the end why, you know, why we're... So I'll play the role of angry, of angry person. <laughs> We're ready for a mouth kiss. We're ready for a mouth kiss.
L-E-P-M-M, okay? And it's called, it stands for Lean Back Penguin Mouth Munch, okay? L-E-P-M-M. So when we're really pissed off at each other, like to the point where we're like, I don't want to see him, just get out of my house, leave me alone for an hour, we call L-B-P-M-M, okay? You guys ready? Okay. <laughs> don't judge us. Just tell us no. So it involves your hands kind of come down like this. So no one's seen this. No one's seen this. No one has seen this before. No, 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 we're in our 40s. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So the hands come down because it's a lean back penguin mouth munch. Head goes down. <laughs> Couple and 
And I think we've already learned so much from Nathan and Chris that <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, we've done a ton of stuff throughout our many, many years uh, that has been separate. Um, but what we really want to focus on tonight is a project that's kind of been part of our, a huge part of our lives, almost all consuming, for about the last five years. And that's um, the Peace Garden at Woodland Farms. So um, what I thought to, to start with, for those who are not familiar with what Woodland Farms is, um, it's a um, therapeutic community for homeless people. Uh, it was running, it's in Central Saanich, it was running for about the last eight years. Uh, it's currently in the news in a very controversial way in that it's probably about to close and from what we can see, um, that seems like an inevitable thing and it's heartbreaking to us. Um, so if, if you're not aware of it, uh, it's based on a model from Italy Called San, a place called San Pacano. Um, and the idea of the farm uh, is that it's a community where people who are struggling with addictions and homelessness and or you know, mental health issues, all of the above, um, where they can heal. They, they live and work on the farm. Um, they have a pattern interrupt from the lifestyle that has been unhealthy for them. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's a family. Um, and, uh, but because of the agricultural land rules, uh, there's, there's been sort of not enough people um, to, to make it a viable thing because the community wouldn't allow them to build the housing that they needed because it's on agricultural land, uh, even though it was going to be temporary housing. And I mean, we could go on and on about the politics of it all and uh, how we feel. And, you know, the bottom line is uh, we believe in the model, we believe it's, it's a beautiful way to help people, uh, and we, we just hope that they can find another way to keep going, if not on that property, then somewhere else. And so, you know, that's sort of the big picture of the, the whole of what Woodland is. Um, sort of in the middle of that picture uh, is this, which is Peace Garden. Um, and I've, uh, I've got another image of it that we'll put up in a minute. Um, but this, this particular image, um, it shows the labyrinth. And uh, Derek, I mean, Derek is the visionary for this project. Uh, and it's been wonderful for us to work together because the same kind of healing, working on the land that, that works for people with addictions and homelessness, um, it actually works for everybody. And it's been an amazing part of our lives and uh, something that, you know, Derek has had the vision to do it, to design a labyrinth, to have a sculpture park, all the things that uh, uh, just we wanted it as something that would bring the community, have the community would have a reason to come to the farm. Um, and, um, you know, it was a public place and hopefully by coming on the farm they would learn more about what was going on there and they would, uh, be more accepting, um, and for many, many people in that community, that did happen. Um, when we hear people call the community a bunch of NIMBYs, we feel horrible because we know that so many of the people there are actually very, very supportive. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's there's some pretty hard and fast rules that the government is just not going to relax in this case, and you know, it's it's not going to work out. Um, but for our project, um, we took uh, basically 0.7 of an acre of land that was called Boneyard and it was full of thistles and it was full of buckberries and uh, we just worked thousands of hours I think if you added it up because we were there especially in the first couple of years we were there five days a week six days a week um, and we put on put in long days uh, summer winter um, but we also many times had volunteer parties that would come and help a little bit, but uh, I'd say, you know, 90% Derek. Um, I was there pretty much every hour that Derek was there, but the amount that I could contribute physically was about one-tenth of what he could do. So, um, and, you know, occasionally volunteers would be there on a Saturday or something, and, you know, we really, really appreciated their help. Um, in the background, you can see um, a kind of an arched thing, and that's um, a piece of my glass art. I have some of my glass art here. Um, 
the glass art that I do, um, I mainly work with recycled glass, and I do mosaics, and I have a kiln, so I can take bottles and broken glass and things that people give me and things that I find at yard sales, um, and make them flat enough in the kiln that I can then glue them onto some base glass. So um, for for the this particular project, um, uh, because we did want to add artwork. Um, the other sculptures are, are Derek's, um, but, uh, but this particular one, I had a, a vision because there's a corner of the Peace Garden um, where we knew that the sun would rise on the winter solstice. Um, so I, I love the idea of seasons and solstice and those kinds of things, and so the piece that I wanted to create for that location would be something to catch the sunrise. And uh, it does, we tested it out the solstice before uh, we actually built it. Um, and uh, our son did the welding and you know, Derek helped with some of the design of how the art should be. But I knew, I always wanted to do something for this location that was going to be sort of overarching um, and that would represent the seasons. So I have in the panels, which you can't see very clearly in this photo, but there's actually six panels. So it kind of goes winter, summer, um, sorry, winter, <laughs> it's spring in there too. Winter, spring, summer, summer actually is a, in two pieces, it's across, and then you get um, the autumn, and then you get back down to winter again, down to the ground. So it's kind of a big circle of the seasons in the different colors of recycled glass. Um, and I was inspired by a quote by Albert Camus, um, in the depth of winter I find within myself an invincible summer. Um, and I thought that that fit very well with what Woodland was all about. It's, um, it's about people who are maybe at a low point in their life, but um, you know, summer is going to come back and we do go through our cycles. Um, so it's really, it's intended to be a mes message of hope. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, that's the labyrinth itself is also another great symbol um, for what woodman is about because in a labyrinth, it's not like a maze, a labyrinth, a true labyrinth, you can't get lost. You follow the path, you keep going, you feel like you're getting farther away from your destination, you keep going, you get closer to your destination, eventually you get there, you just follow the path. Um, and then, of course, when you get to the destination, you turn around and you go back out again, the same process. Um, we have just loved every minute that we've spent there. Uh, we believe it's up for sale now. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if this peace garden that we've built together um, is, is going to survive. It could be paved over, and there could be a marijuana farm, and it could be uh, with barbed wire and security systems, and you know all the things that just break our hearts. Um, but um, you know, I think of um, a Buddha board. I don't know if anybody has ever seen. They're just sort of it's a piece of silk, I believe, and it's stretched over a board, and you dip a paintbrush in water, and you paint on the board. And almost by the time you finish the painting, you have this beautiful black painting on a gray background, but it's drying almost as quickly as you paint it. And so almost when you're finished, it's disappeared again. So things are impermanent, and that's what life is about. But we still feel hopeful, and we think that things can be rebuilt. Um, I recycle glass, you know, something that somebody threw away. I give it a new life. Uh, maybe the whole process of woodland will have a new life. And that's what we're hoping for. So I will put the other image on in there. And... <laughs> well, I should say that uh, definitely Elizabeth uh, moved a lot of those rocks that right now there's um, 6,000 rocks just in the labyrinth itself. And uh, Elizabeth definitely did a big part of it. Um, it's been a, a, an absolute joy to have been a part of Woodwind, and uh, nothing is wasted, even though uh, it might come to an end. Uh, I'd like to just give you a quick little rundown of what drew me to um, consider doing something along this line of uh, using the earth. I've got a history of uh, doing projects where one, for example, was up in the north, I took a 42-ton bulldozer up into the mountains on an abandoned gravel pit. 
and I did uh, a mother and child image on the ground. Um, the National Film Board of Canada did a documentary following my work, and it was basically uh, related to uh, what was happening in the Gulf Wars. Uh, the Gulf Wars caught my attention uh, very early, and uh, so I spent a heck of a lot of time getting very depressed, uh, working on artwork that I was hoping would uh, raise awareness about what we were doing over there. And uh, I made a number of trips to Baghdad. And I was able to go into different places and bear witness to what, what we were doing. And I, I tried to use my art to raise awareness with our governments to try and stop them from doing that. With the documentary that aired across Canada at the time, I feel like it played at least a little tiny role in um, making our governments decide not to support the Americans to go in, because uh, this was like all across Canada, this documentary aired just as they were making the decisions on whether or not they want to take part. But I should say that the work that I did there uh, was very depressing and uh, it actually came between Elizabeth and I. Uh, we had quite a bit of struggle because uh, it was just way too much emotional involvement, engagement. And uh, so we had to try and work through that. Uh, by working on something like this Peace Garden, uh, we were able to, it was so much nicer to be actually doing a project together instead of uh, me doing my thing and Elizabeth doing her thing. And so this has been really good for us. Uh, it's, um, the whole garden is uh, jam-packed full of, uh, you know, crops. It's got uh, 150 lavender plants on their little spikes. Uh, and there's 500 edible sage in the inside. There's kiwi trees growing on those. Uh, it looks like a thing that holds up uh, with the, <laughs> the driftwood trellis. Thank you. So uh, there are blueberry bushes, there's apple trees. Uh, the whole thing is uh, dedicated to growing crops. And uh, the, the, the whole idea of it really was to try and create something that would act as a bridge to the community. And uh, we feel it's done that. Uh, it was people would come onto the farm that's because they'd maybe see an article on the labyrinth or the peace garden, and they, they would normally never come onto the farm, but because they were curious about what this thing was, and then they'd come onto the farm and start talking to the participants and talking to uh, the people who were running the farm, and uh, then they'd be volunteering for the farm. So, so it worked out really well. A new and dear friend for me, and I would like to introduce her, and she's going to speak to us tonight, the incredible, the talented, the delightful, great soul and bright light, Vinnie Devine. Dragon. <laughs> I realized the 
that this wasn't true. <laughs> but enough of fear, the mic, um, and on to back on to love. I, I feel so special, or so grateful that I was in a relationship with another professional artist for 23 years. And it was just wonderful. We, um, we really supported each other and um, we, we celebrated each other's successes and encouraged each other and there's something else that I want to say but it's brain blanking too. Um, Moving on, um, we were we were we we're both in commercial galleries across Canada. We both have work in collections around the world, and the art gallery of Greater Victoria, of course, has been just so important to our careers. The era of the sales and rental program, and John Matson here, the gallery shop. And of course, Victoria's favorite art event, the Moth Street Painting, or the AGV TV Painting. Um, <laughs> for 13 consecutive years, we both were part of it. And um, it's just a wonderful experience for an artist because in one day, you get to meet about 40,000 people and share your art with everyone. And as well as that, you're outside, and Jeffrey and I both love nature very much, and so we took opportunities when schedules and weather and travels allowed, we would go and paint outdoors together. And there's two paintings in there that you'll see that were the last paintings that we painted together. And it was unusual for us to be facing the same direction. Different things would appeal to each of us. And so usually we'd be off in different directions or facing opposite directions. But that, it was Jeffrey's birthday and it was the end of October and it was just the most beautiful day. And afterwards we discovered that we painted very much the same view, just of course, opposite sides of the street. And, um, what else can I tell you? Um, just, it's it's so lovely to be here tonight. The art gallery, thank you all. Thank you all the artists. And thank you, Jeffrey. And big love. Thank you, collectors, friends. Big love to everybody and happy Valentine's Day. Mingle, <laughs> mingle. <laughs>